Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'll start the logistical announcements in a minute, but as usual, type where you are in the world. We'd love to see where you are, and happy second day of Healthcare Sim Week. Okay, we're a minute to the top of the hour, so I'll do our logistical announcements. Uh, throughout the presentation, Dr. Akuda will be taking questions, so please type your questions in the chat and our moderator, Cynthia Mosier, will read them aloud. At the end, if we have time in the presentation, we will allow you to unmute yourself and we can have an active discussion via audio. But again, please type any questions in the chat box. We'll read them aloud and welcome. Okay, we are just at top of the hour now. I'd like to welcome you all to the webinar, Future Opportunities in Healthcare Simulation by Dr. Haru Okuda. Uh, Dr. Okuda is the Executive Director of the University of Florida Health Center for, for Advanced Medical Simulation. In this role, he is oversight of a 90,000 square foot state-of-the-art advanced training facility with the mission of creating and providing experiential learning that improves clinical skills and patient care in the community and around the globe. In addition to this role, Dr. Okuda also serves as USF Health's Assistant Vice President of the Office of Interprofessional Education and Practice, which is focused on creating interprofessional learning opportunities from early healthcare training to clinical practice. He is professor at the Morsani College of Medicine and practices clinically in the emergency department at Tampa General Hospital. Prior to coming to USF Health, Dr. Okuda was the National Medical Director for the Simulation Learning Education and Research Network, SimLearn, where he established national strategy and business plans for simulation-based programs at more than 150 U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs medical facilities. In addition to his role as National Medical Director of SimLearn, Dr. Okuda served as the Acting Deputy Chief of Patient Care Services Officer for the Veterans Health Administration, where he was responsible for policy development and oversight of the National Office for Women's Health Care, Community and Preventative Health, Social Work and Pharmacy Benefits Management. Before joining the VA, he was Assistant Vice President and Director of the Institute for Medical Simulation and Advanced Learning for the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, the largest public health system in the United States. Dr. Okuda received his Bachelor of Science degree in Neuroscience from Brown University, his medical degree from New York Medical College, and his Certificate in Healthcare Modeling and Simulation from the Naval Postgraduate School in California. He completed a residency in emergency medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, where he served as their chief resident and then completed a clinical quality fellowship with the Greater New York Hospital Association. He is a fellow of the American College of American Physicians and an inaugural fellow of the Society for Simulation and Healthcare Academy. He also served as chair and member of several medical and simulation committees and was most recently appointed president-elect for the Society of Simulation and Healthcare. He has co-authored numerous textbooks, peer-reviewed publications, and textbook chapters. Known for his passion for teaching, innovation, and business, Dr. Okuda received the 2017 Distinguished Educator Award by the Society for Academic Emergency Medicine, Simulation Academy, for the creation of the simulation-based training program, SimWars. He was named one of the top 25 healthcare leaders under 40 by New York's Rising Stars in Business by Crane's New York Business Magazine in 2011 and was awarded the 2017 Healthcare and Medicine Leader of the Year by I4 Business Magazine. Please join me in help and welcoming Dr. Okuda. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes. A couple head nods, perfect. Um, so super excited to be here uh, today with all of you. I, I see there are many folks from around the world. So uh, I love to connect and it's extremely awkward still in this virtual environment, but we'll do the best we can. Uh, happy Healthcare Simulation Week to all. Uh, we are day two, I guess, in in the, the work day, work week. Um, hope you are all um, doing some really interesting, innovative things. We here at Camels are doing our share of fun activities. And so 
love to hear from you all uh, later in the conversation. Um, so I'd like this to be ideally a conversation because we are a simulation and we're not supposed to be lectured at. Um, this should be a dialogue or more better, it would be just immersive, but I'm sorry we can't do that. So um, for sure, um, if you can include your questions and I'd, I'd love to take them in real time. And then at the end, love to have all your faces on if possible and have a conversation around this. Um, so I I will say that, let's see, advance. Um, so, you know, this is sort of the disclosure. So, you know, the future opportunities in healthcare simulation is a pretty broad topic. Um, and it's pr pretty presumptuous for me to say that I know what the future opportunities are. So I think my disclosure, I think, you know, whether it's medical um, advice or life advice, career advice, you have to all take into perspective, you know, the perspective of the individual giving that advice. So my disclosure is this, it's, um, it's from my perspective of where I see some of the future opportunities are. Some of them are past successes, some of them are current successes, um, and this is not a comprehensive um, list, but um, and, and, and I would love for folks to disagree with me and say, I don't believe that is a future opportunity or here's another one that maybe you hadn't thought of. And that's why for me, this is a great learning opportunity. That's why I'm so excited to be um, talking to you all. So um, just a quick on my background. I, I think Cynthia did, <laughs> did a comprehensive job. She read my whole bio, which was a lot. Um, but uh, I'll just say that I started simulation in academia um, uh, I was associate residency director, so all of my simulation came from initially um, my experiences around errors in medicine as a resident back in medical student where I either saw them or I felt, you know, near misses myself in New York City, said we got it, there's got to be a better way of doing this. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to have been at uh, Mount Sinai in New York where Adam Levine um, one of the pioneers in healthcare simulation was the program, is still the program director of anesthesia and was gracious enough to allow me into his lab and took me under his wing with Chad, who I, you know, I, 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 I still miss dearly. Uh, he was a fellow at the time when I was a, a first year attending and we both learned simulation together and collaborated together. So um, that is my background. It's really rooted in patient safety. How do we improve that? And also how do we improve uh, residency training and education. And, and my, my career has evolved in sort of how I look at simulation, but I just wanted to give you a sense of where I was rooted. Um, and then also I, I moved into medical student education during my years at Mount Sinai. From there, um, I, w I had a, a, a short stint at the New York City Public Health System. Uh, Katie Walker has done an incredible job um, over the you know 10 plus years um, since I, I, I was there, but I I helped uh, start the um, uh, New York City Health and Hospital Corporation simulation program. And, and my focus there was really sort of, you know, looking at how do we improve patient care, team training in a large um, health system. Um, and so it shifted from residents to medical students to, you know, how do we help frontline healthcare teams, providers improve healthcare and, and patient safety. From there, I went to the uh, Veteran Affairs um, and I had the fortune privilege of, um, uh, of building a simulation program. Again, this was really focused around improving healthcare in, in a large, um, you know, 150 plus medical system, uh, um, uh, um, healthcare system with like 120,000, I think, healthcare uh, staff. So that, you know, that, that's where I'm coming from. Um, as far as my context, and just currently, I'm at Camels. I've been here for over three years now, um, you know, and our mission is, and this is a mission that I was able to contribute to through um, an organization when I got here, there wasn't really a, uh, as clear of a mission. And our mission is to create and provide experiential learning that improves clinical skills and patient care in our community and around the globe and improving healthcare through lifelong education and training. So that is my framework. And so, I'm going to launch into sort of my my list and discussion. Oh, last one. Um, Camels, we're a big sim center, lots of uh, capabilities in Tampa, in Florida. Please, uh, if you're ever in Tampa, love to have you, uh, preferably post-COVID, 
uh, at least Delta strain with surge going down, but would you know, happy to give anybody who's on this webinar a tour uh, at some point. All right, so the first topic, now that you've heard my background, it's gonna be really framed around patient safety and quality improvement. Um, and, and, and I think people, if you go to SSH, you go to you know, different conferences, you're gonna have incredible sessions around many of these topics, but you know, just thinking in terms of where I feel you know, there is really great opportunity still in the future um, around these topics. So um, the, the first one, this is in no particular order. I think the first one that everyone is probably aware of, and you can see in the, the first picture in the middle is really around difficult conversations. And I think um, we haven't done as good of a job with this. I think some healthcare systems have done an incredible job, but you know, um, you know whether this starts in the student um, perspective, which I think you know, student, whether it's nursing student, medical student, you know, different levels of healthcare professionals um, or residents, um, you know, have, you know, disclosing bad news, errors in medicine. Um, it's, it's an area that I think there's plenty of literature about, you know, doing it well, you know, one has a significant impact on sort of the trauma that individuals get um, you know, or not get, uh, or maybe reducing it from a difficult news situation. But we, I don't think we've translated that into as much simulation um, uh, training as we can. And so I think this is a big area um, that, you know, will hopefully grow in the future uh, around this, this topic. I think the other uh, studies have shown uh, early error disclosure um, you know, if you're talking about ROI for a hospital, and, and I hate thinking about error disclosure and ROI, but, you know, a hospital system, um, many studies showing that there's a reduced um, uh, claims, malpractice payout. So I think there are both the, the right reasons of doing this kind of training, but also their financial uh, benefits as well. So I think, you know, that's an area that I think we can do better and do more of. Um, the next topic, uh, the next area, new procedures technology. I, I think this is an area that I think we are doing pretty well. Um, and whether you know, you're implementing a new ECMO program, which is in the picture in the middle at a, at a facility, um, or let's, I, I remember back, I'm an ER doc, so back 15, no, 20 years ago when video laryngoscopes were introduced, I remember the way we introduced them was there was a, uh, an industry or a vendor person came to the emergency department, they gave out pizza and say, here, let me train you on this device. Um, the residents took to it much, much quicker. They're like, oh, this is great, this technology. Um, the, the more of the, 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 the ED docs that have been practicing for a while through the old school method of a steel in hand and intubation was like, I'm never gonna do that. And what drove change was the residents that picked it up quickly, they're the gamers and I said, oh, this is great. And now I wanna do this on the next patient that comes in the door. And you know, the attendees like, you know, really nervous about it. And, and so I think we've done a much better job 20 plus years later, but you know, I think we still have the ability of using simulation to implement test or implement new procedures, new technology into healthcare systems. And um, again, I don't think we do that enough, right? I think you know, we have all this technologies that's coming out, being introduced into hospitals, clinics. Some are easy, they won't have adverse uh, impact, but even like H, H, uh, EMR systems and other software systems, I think we can be using simulation much better um, uh, to introduce that technology. Um, high risk, low frequency events. This is the bread and butter of simulation. Um, again, ECMO might be a good example though. We're doing a ton of it now with COVID. Well, I'm in Florida, so you, you hear the numbers here and we have a lot of patients on ECMO, um, but these are the fire in the OR or malignant hyperthermia in the OR or difficult airway, expanding neck hematoma, um, the, the things that are really, really scary. I think we've been doing this pretty well in healthcare simulation. Um, there are a lot of uh, nice simulations that are being introduced. Um, these are sort of the fun things that I think, at least as an emergency physician, it might be fun to build these kind of cases. Um, but again, this should continue. And I think, you know, as we identify new emerging illnesses and diseases, I think we'll have to do more and more of this. Um, rehearsal, um, I think there is good literature to suggest that, you know, some, um, at least, especially for uh, surgeons, uh, pre, pre, um, pre, 
pre-OR, pre-case rehearsal, um, especially for certain types of procedures can be very helpful. I've heard some folks anecdotally say that they'll actually put the simple OR cases early in the morning to get kind of warmed up and then they bring in more complex cases and, and these are with real patients. And so, you know, if there is an ability to do some warm up and rehearsal prior to going to the OR for these types of procedures, I think there is value. If you think in terms, I always think, sort of try to compare in terms of like music or sports, I like both. And with both music and sports, I played the violin, music, I warmed up with scales, I warmed up with arpeggios prior to, you know, getting into the harder stuff. Um, for sports as well, you do your stretches, you do jogs, and, and, and we don't do that in healthcare. And so I think it just makes sense, but we don't have an easy way of doing it. And I hope we start um, incorporating more and more of that. Um, skills degradation and maintenance. Um, this is when I was at the VA and I was talking with my colleagues in the DOD, I think this was a hot topic. You have, um, especially during our, our 20 year war, we had you know GI docs that are going out into theater, you know, for for a year, and then they come back, and you know, they the last time they did a colonoscopy, because they're sort of busy, they're so busy doing trauma or other types of activities, they now you know they have to get back and doing scopes. That's that's a problem, right? And and I know when we were working with the DoD, they were trying to figure out with how do we get these um, uh, you know uh, servicemen and women um, that back into their regular practice. Uh, after some skills degradation, and I think there are opportunities there. There are many reasons why a you know a nurse or a physician or somebody goes you know stops practice for a year or two years or six months, um, and using simulation to sort of get back into the swing of things um, from a broader, longer term, I think is really important. Um, handoffs, I think this is a no brainer. So if you look at the oh, so I, I, was, I forgot the pictures on the bottom left is a conjoined twins uh, rehearsal, which I think there are multiple children's hospitals. I know Johns Hopkins, I know Boston Children's, I think this is from Boston Children's Hospital uh, picture, um, do the rehearsal and, and, and you know it's in the news and it just makes a lot of sense. Um, on the bottom right is a handoff, uh, interprofessional handoff we did at Camels. Uh, we had paramedics, um, we had um, ED attendings, residents and nurses from our level one trauma center where they were all on camels and they practiced doing a handoff of a cardiac arrest uh, simulation. Human factors, light and safety. Um, so this is a big one. You know, when you are building a new facility or uh, redoing a new uh, ICU um, with equipment, et cetera, um, you want to use simulation to test it to make sure that, you know, um, these, these general equipment process flow isn't, um, aren't gonna be any issues when you actually have real patients. This on the top left was when we were at the VA, we we're opening up four brand new hospitals and we actually ran uh, multiple simulations in order to test their protocols and procedures. And we identified hundreds of potential latent safety threats. And it was very impactful, I think, to the opening. Um, other things that you can do sim doing simulation that w when I was at the VA that we did was we uh, had, um, you know, when they were by doing a, a, a broad, purchase of a device in the health system. Um, they actually brought um, the, the procurement folks brought uh, the equi the different types of equipment from different vendors to the sim center and then they had human factors specialists evaluate the equipment for you know human factors issues and that can help go into the decisions for purchasing equipment. So I, I think another area where there are there are pockets of expertise within the simulation community. We have lots of great human factors experts that are now joining uh, sim, sim um, uh, teams and organizations, which I think are really exciting. Um, in situ codes, again, bread and butter. Um, I don't think I need to get in too much detail around that, but you know the power both from a training standpoint, but also from, again, testing the system, improving the system. I think usually that's that's the payoff there. Um, and codes can be code blue, um, a rapid response, um, you know, it could be, you know, anesthesia, you know, different types of codes um, are very powerful. Team training, um, again, a bread and butter and simulation. I think we are doing it a lot. We're doing it well. I wish we had sort of one language that we've adopted across the whole system. There are different types of team training language um, that exists, but I think at the end of the day, um, a hospital or healthcare system or a school just needs to endorse and embrace one and teach that one. 
um, or else it gets really confusing. But you know, whether it's CRM, team steps, there's a lot of other things that folks can teach. Um, and then procedural competency. Again, this is a, a no-brainer. Whether it's putting IVs in, ultrasound-guided IVs, you know that now you're you're joining the old old technique with a new technology, though it's not that new anymore. Um, but I think you know teaching that is I think one piece. Actually, assessing for competence is the next level. That um, there are hospitals that require central line uh, evaluation for competence. Um, also for IV placement with ultrasound for competence um, and um, going through simulation centers. And there's a lot of great studies out in Washington, out in North uh, in uh, Chicago and, and New Haven around certain procedures and, and they're, they're, they're validated and, and we should be adopting them more, especially in hospitals and healthcare systems. So how do we do this? Um, and this is, um, this is just on the topic of patient safety. This is a big one for me. Um, you know, I've, it, you know, you try as much as you can from a grassroots standpoint to say this is the right thing to do. It just makes a lot of sense. And for many, many years, I was like, well, it's obvious. It's the right thing to do. There's, there's evidence, there's studies, but apparently that's often not enough. Um, and so, you know, there's a carrot in the stick um, piece. I, I think we as a healthcare organization or simulate, we're not a healthcare organization, I would be clear. SSH is not a healthcare organization, but we as simulation experts that represent um, members of other organizations, I think there's a great opportunity to advocate, um, to really, you know, at least educate folks on um, the importance of, uh, uh, and, and the evidence around simulation in improving patient safety and quality. And whether it's at the national board level, um, the regulators like the Joint Commission, which I, I was excited to see, at least in the US, the Joint Commission, I think the Joint Commission standards are sometimes adopted uh, overseas as well. And I apologize, these are sort of the three US examples, but it would be sort of equivalent in your respective countries as well. Um, the Joint Commission is often, you know, regulates quality across our US hospital systems. Um, they recently in the U.S. incorporated a re requirement around obstetrical drills in, um, uh, I think it's uh, dystocia and hypertension, hypertension uh, as of January of this month. And so now there is some language built in that uh, requires drills for emergency and LND floors uh, for practicing these types of uh, things. And that includes using simulation, which I think is a great step forward. Um, you know, uh, our federal government, there's opportunities there. Um, and then oftentimes, especially for procedures, it's hospital dependent, hospital based. Um, it's their privileging, credentialing. Um, and, and hopefully if, if there are more national guidelines, then there could be more incentives for hospitals to require it for their systems. All right, so I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. That's my, my, my high level in patient safety and quality improvement. Uh, I'll pause for a second. Are there any questions around this topic? And again, we can have a discussion at the end, but wanted to see if there's anything specific before I move to the next topic. Uh, no specific questions, just a few shares that uh, still not enough, isn't it amazing? And it was awesome. We've, we've integrated that for our children's emergency department. And then Lilia said, we, should, we just did a so shoulder dystocia with OBGYN residents. That's awesome. Okay. All right, so moving to the next topic. Research. So, um, so you know, when I talk about trying to advocate and um, get organizations to adopt simulation, you know, the pushback has always been, "Where is the evidence? You know, show me the evidence. Does it improve outcomes? It's really expensive." Um, you know, I, I think having given many pre presentations over my 20 plus year career in simulation, I think we've come very far. And I always use the evidence, at least in my world of advocacy around patient safety. And it's really helpful. Uh, I love, and I really appreciate the hard work that the researchers in simulation, healthcare simulation are doing because it helps my job, um, uh, definitely. Um, but the challenge is even with research, we sometimes don't get adoption. And so um, I think we've come a long way. Um, if I, I recently sort of just did a quick search of types of grants available. So there's research that should be done. And then there's research that can be done because it's funded, 
right? And this, this should be done. We need to do both, right? Just because there isn't funding to do research doesn't mean that research shouldn't be done. And I think there's a lot of patient safety, quality, educational research that needs to be done, but nobody's willing to pay for it. And then especially around educational research, the groups like the Josiah Maisie Jr. Foundation and other educational groups, even at uh, SSH or Axel or ASPE, I think they all have grants, but you know, they are smaller grants. They're not the $100,000 million dollar grants that the federal government gives. Um, so those things definitely need to occur. But in sort of quick review of sort of what are um, the grants that are available in forming research, um, I, I would say it sort of falls, I, I've seen it falling into about four buckets. You know, health disparities is a huge one. So important. It should be done. And there are people that have been doing it. I think there's more attention to it. And so if there is an opportunity to use simulation to address um, health disparities, both in terms of bias in, um, um, in, in, in conversations with patients based off of whether it's conscious or unconscious bias, um, if there are other, you know, there are definitely disparity, dis disparities between different races, different countries, with um, um, compliance with medications or you know, sp specific disease processes. And so I think there's great opportunity um, using healthcare simulation from a training and education standpoint, both for our healthcare professionals, as, you know, especially for healthcare professionals, because you know, in an ideal world you have, you probably would have the same background individual as a healthcare deliver, whether, you know, athletic trainer, nurse, pharmacist, talking to the patient, they're from the same background. And there's studies to show that there's much more, there is more compliance when somebody that looks like them is giving them um, education or advice. Um, but, you know, until we get to that point in the future, which I think is still going to be some time away, we're going to have to be able to teach our workforce to really have cultural um Humility, which I think will be uh, one of our talks later this this week, and I'm looking forward to that, um, so that um, we really um, can give the best possible care. Um, another area, learning innovation, um, and I'll talk a little bit about innovation later, but in areas, especially with COVID, you have a lot of needs for virtual training, and it's it really accelerated. The funds, the grants are there. Um, so, you know, how do we train a workforce in a remote way, in an effective way, equal to or better than traditional ways? Um, patient safety. Um, there used to be a lot of nice grants around patient safety. AHRQ was one of them. I think it went away in the last um, couple of years. Um, but I think there are still some, some good opportunities around patient safety. And then interestingly, a very focused area, skill acquisition, um, there's some DO, nice DOD grants around this. You know, how do you monitor, assess, and ensure that folks have good skills? Um, and so, you know, I think these are four buckets around research. I'm not going to get into too many of the details. I am not a researcher, though we are starting to do some research at Camels, and so my, not my area of expertise. You can ask me about patient safety, quality improvement all day, um, but I will defer to the experts on this one. But at least these are some of the buckets that I've seen. Uh, moving into technology and innovation, um, this was me at, uh, at um, oh my gosh, uh, somebody's going to be typing in the chat box. It's, it's the uh, Orlando-based uh, modeling simulation meeting, uh, ITSEC, sorry. Um, it's, the inter, it's the federal intergovernmental corporate um, simulation. It's the largest probably in the world. Um, they have tank simulators and you know, helicopter simulators and all kinds of cool things in the Orlando Convention Center. There's a small area on healthcare, which is which is still cool and brings people from other uh, uh, areas that may not necessarily attend IMSH. Um, this was uh, I got to test a haptic glove, and this is pre-COVID, so this is a little bit ago, um, and it was getting pretty good. The, the the tactile feedback, and I felt like the weight of a pen or or other things. Um, but you know, just, just the picture. So three areas around technology innovation. There are many, many, many others, um, but I think you know, AR, so augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, I added haptics in there. Haptics doesn't have to be coupled with these three. They could be with other 
forms of training as well. But I think that is definitely uh, part of the future of training. It's not a, it's not a, uh, to my, my opinion is that it's not something that is a trend that will go away. Um, I remember there were these vir virtual caves or waves, these huge rooms with crazy technology, which you know, we were debating on putting into the VA or not, we ended up not doing it. Um, I think there's still applications for that, but I think people have gotten away from that because there's other technology like VR, AR that is much cheaper and uh, much more portable. So um, to my opinion, VR, AR, XR is not going away. It's gonna be a part of our, our, our training in the future. We'll just have to see where it fits. Um, gamification, so this is a crash card game that we had uh, built when uh, I was working in the VA. It's a simple concept, but it's, you know, crash carts are configured differently in different hospitals. And how, you know, now back in my day when I was an ER doc, I would open all the drawers and I just familiarize myself with everything in the crash cart, but now it's all locked. And then if you open it, people get mad at you. So, you know, how do you know what's in it? And then you have to know where things are only in, in emergencies when people are, are you, know, you know, having a cardiac arrest. So uh, at the VA, we created a game that you could customize on uh, what goes into your crash cart um, and you can actually train and gamifying it. People are in healthcare are very competitive, I think by nature, um, it's part of our training. And so, you know, now if you have scores, you incentive, how fastly can you find all, how fast can you find all these pieces of equipment? Um, it is fun and it also allows you to uh, learn where things are in a crash cart. Uh, one of one game that I thought was simple but really interesting. If anybody's from Stanford, there was a Septris game, Sepsis and Tetris, and these little faces come out of the sky like Tetris. And as they get closer to the bottom, they look sadder and sadder until if they hit the bottom, they die. And the goal at that time was early goal directed therapy when that was the big thing. And you have to like manage and multitask all these patients coming from the sky. Again, a very simple concept, but you know like. Um, uh, Fruit Ninja and other things, it's it's very addicting and you sort of just kind of kind of, you know, play it and then you learn the stuff. So um, gamifying, it doesn't have to be video. It could be, you could gamify any, really. Uh, Monopoly is a game. That's a board game. Um, last one, 3D printing. Uh, the tissue technology is getting better and better. I, you know, there are sim centers that have 3D printing as a part of their um, offerings. Um, it doesn't have to be. They often sometimes end up in radiology or other places. It's a collaborative, interprofessional uh, focus. Um, but this is something I pulled off the internet. I forgot what site it was from, but man, does that look real? Um, the the 3D printing, the, 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 the feel, the tissue is getting better and better. And I think that will be a part of simulation and, and here to stay. So again, there's lots of other technology innovation. Love to hear about it. Um, so the next topic, uh, I'll pause for a second. Perfect. Anything? Yes. Yeah, just a second. Just wanted to share with you, uh, Dr. Susie Cardenegrin is here with us, and she said those gloves you have are amazing, the ones that you had on. They cost a fortune, but let you feel weight. Yes, yes. Yeah. These are pretty cool. And this is like two or three years ago. And so imagine now. I've seen, um, I thought I saw on their website, Bezos was playing with them. So it's gotten pretty high level of attention from some really wealthy people. And I keep going, I see all this technology all the time. And I, you know, had I invested a few times, I probably would retire by now, but I, I am by heart uh, patient safety in academia. So I will always never be, you know, a, a Bezos or something like that. It's just part of our nature. Um, so curricular advancement. Uh, so, you know, again, my, I, my, my initial simulation was rooted in uh, training education for our stem cell level students. Um, and so I think a couple of areas that I think um, are really important that I'm, I'm seeing more and more of, and I've seen some educational grants around this. Interprofessional education is a big one. Um, it seems pretty straightforward and obvious. Um, there are other countries that are doing much better than the US. I can only speak from a US perspective. I, as, as, I, as you heard, I have a second title around um, interprofessional education and practice, um, but the interprofessional education side is about students learning from each other about each other from different professions. And so having a pharmacy student uh, learn with a nursing student or a physical therapy student or public health, right? Learning together early on 
before they're sort of turn into their various organ systems. Like, you know, if, we, if we're talking, if we're taking the stem cell analogy out, like, you know, before they turn into a heart or to a, to a liver, right? And they're different professions. If they at least learn about each other from each other, I think as you progress and become different and distinct, you'll still have a shared respect and understanding. And I think at least in my generation, we didn't do that well. I never worked with other students besides medical students. Um, even when I was a resident, it was just my resident world. Um, and then it wasn't until I finished uh, residency that I said, oh, I have to work with all these other people. And nobody taught me who they were and how they fit into the whole picture. And as long as you learn that way, you think your, your goals are the most important. Um, and then as you understand what the different professions do, you realize every profession's approach is important and the goals are important and you got to work collaboratively to accomplish it. Um, extending that is interprofessional practice. I think we have a lot of catch up to do in folks that graduated, um, you know, before the current generations graduating because we train in silos. And I think there's a great opportunity to help um, bridge that gap and improve training and understanding. The, the, the simulation on the bottom left was a, one of my favorite simulations. We were at the, um, uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning, the Lightning, um, and Stanley Cup two years in a row, I'll put that plug in. Um, but we do on ice emergencies at Emily Arena. Um, and we only started doing that a couple of years ago. It used to all be tabletop, but you know, listed in the picture, you'll see uh, local paramedics, um, physicians, athletic trainers. Um, and you know, it's interesting, they don't have nurses. Uh, I think they should, but that's just sort of how their system is made up. So, um, and then we have simulation operations specialists in the foreground. Um, so, oh, and, and a lot of different other professions in uh, uh, physicians as well. So, you know, working together with common goals, I think is really important for simulation. Um, you know, if I don't uh, no diversity, equity, inclusion is extremely important. I think we are way behind. And I think finally there's attention to this and that we are building in training. Um, and it, I think it has to be at the student level, but also the practice level. Um, and I, I alluded to some of that when I was talking about health equity. Um, but I think there is great opportunity for using standardized patients in this area around DEI. So um, another area for curricular advancement. Um, and finally, I think the competency assessment outcomes, um, we've been doing it much, much better, but you know, I think there is still great opportunity to advance sort of on the, you know, what if you go Kirkpatrick's level four, level five, you know, three, four, five, you know, ROI piece, ROI is more business, but I think just, just looking at um, more things and improving that area, I think is gonna be really important and impactful. We have a question, Dr. Okuda. Yes. Barbara Sittner asks, are you using curriculum maps to integrate simulation into your programs, linking outcomes? So um, I will, I'll defer that a little bit till later. Um, and, and part of what, in, in, the, in the context around that is that at CAMELS, I have to sort of explain CAMELS a little bit. CAMELS is this large simulation center and we have both an internal and external facing learner group. The internal facing learner group is the College of Nursing, College of Pharmacy, Public Health, College of Medicine. Um, and so we support the, you know, running the programs, um, you know, all the simulations, but we have experts within each group like Don Shockin, who I know many of you know, who runs the medical student program for, um, for our school. Um, Dr. Alan Todd, who's the Assistant Dean for Simulation in College of Nursing. So we have different leads that focus in their student bodies and student groups. And so I'm not intimately involved with their curricula. And so I wouldn't be able to answer that, um, you know, clearly. And then, and then our external audience, we, we have, you know, societies, healthcare systems, industry, all other kinds of groups come to CAMELS um, as well. So um, I think that's a great conversation to have uh, at the end, but I, I just can't give a quick answer to that. All right, I know we're, I'll, I'll move a little faster since I see Colleen, she's probably giving me the eye saying, you need to speed up. All right, uh, so disaster response. Uh, I think this is both, uh, you know, it's both an opportunity, it's also a burden. Um, and I'll say not burden because it's, 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 it is the right thing to do, 
but sometimes organizations look to the Sim Center to fix every problem. And so, or it can deplete your resources. Um, and so it, it can be very challenging. This is um, a training that we did for Tampa General Hospital in like April of last year, right when COVID started. Um, but as you can imagine, you know, mass casualty training, I think we are doing it. The disaster drills, I think some places, you know, hospitals, the, the Joint Commission requires disaster drills for all hospitals. I've been through some disaster drills. Some are good, some are not good. Um, I think you know, if they involve simulationists, it could be much better in terms of fidelity and outcomes. Um, and I think there's a great opportunity there. And unfortunately, in the U.S., there has been a tremendous uptick of um, mass shootings and other mass casualty events. And so we're going to need to do more and more of this. And I think the engagement from the simulation community is going to be really important to have meaningful drills as opposed to sort of check the box. Um, climate crisis is another big one. On the bottom left, um, we actually did a multi-response um, uh, a drill evacuation. It was a hurricane drill from Mississippi, I think, and we actually had a, a C-17. I, I forget the name of it, but it's the big, big uh, cargo jet fly in, unload standardized patients, and then we had the transport to different hospitals. Um, and multiple hospitals were involved with the VA and the Florida Department of State uh, Health, as well as the military. Um, but as the climate crisis, you know, fires and floods and other things increase, I think our need to drill um, is going to be really important. I put COVID in, in Ebola in the same group. When Ebola was out, when I was at the VA, we did a lot of testing our capabilities uh, using simulation. And I think, you know, COVID hopefully knock on wood for the next pandemic uh, will be after my lifetime, but you know, I think we just have to be prepared. So those are, again, not comprehensive. I probably didn't think of all the topics, but I just wanted to sort of throw them out there. We have limited time in talking about career, future opportunities. Healthcare is a big topic. I, I really wanted to have more of a discussion. I did just wanna address the one piece, which is, you know, I think on the left-hand side, this is us in healthcare simulation. We do some incredible, incredible things as a, um, as a profession, a professional society, um, as individuals and teams within uh, hospitals, healthcare systems, schools, uh, all over the world. Uh, I did wanna to touch on sort of, you know, where does that leave a person? So if you're that single aunt and saying, hey, okay, so what, what is there, what's in it for me? What's my future look like? I would say the future is great. Um, so I, I, I like this, I, I had uh, created a few slides for the SimOps presentation. I just, I, I like the slide and I discovered some cool things. So I wanted to share it. So career opportunities in simulation 20 years ago. So think back 20 years ago, some of you maybe were not born or were like five years old. Others of us were younger, um, but you know, maybe weren't in health profession career yet. Um, but if you think about who was running simulation 20 years ago, um, it looks very different than who's running simulation now. So I was actually able to find the earliest picture that I was able to find of a simulation that we did when I was at Mount Sinai was this one, uh, May in 2006. Um, we had dragged the, the, the first generation Laredal mannequin. You can even see the, the GUI, the, the software is the first generation one with an old monitor from Adam Levine's shop. We brought it to the emergency department, but who's running the simulation? You know, so the instructor is a physician, the sim operator is a physician, and the learners are physicians. It was all discipline specific. I don't, I don't, in 2006, I don't know if I had even understood or heard the simulation operations specialist position. Um, and what changed? So if you look in 2006, um, the fifth annual international meeting on medical simulation was in 2006. So it was called medical simulation. Um, uh, the Society for Medical Simulation was the organization. Um, and then in, it, it's, we switched over to the Society for Simulation Healthcare. If you actually look, the first article, the first journal, Simulation Healthcare, 2006, Dr. Gaba, he said the me membership is united by its desire to improve performance and reduce errors in patient care using all types of simulation. Um, the Society for Medical Simulation is a broad, best, multidisciplinary, multi-specialty, international society, and ties to all medical specialties, nursing, 
allied health paramedical professional and in industry. So I think this was the initial, you know, I think Dr. Gaba really saw that this needed to be interprofessional. You know, he's the CRM, um, you know, uh, you know, a person and, and he really understood the interprofessional piece. And then you have Dan Raymer soon, uh, I think page 63, says uh, the new name, so they changed the name to the Society for Simulation and Healthcare, welcoming to all specialty degree holders and all forms of simulation, embodying all an important part of the vision of the society. Additionally, Society for Simulation and Healthcare creates an impression we believe of leadership, breadth, and purpose that will serve us well into the future. And now, you know, 2006, 15 years later, we have multiple different professionals within simulation, which I think is really exciting. Um, if you look at now, uh, 15 years later, I just Googled for fun, medical simulation, healthcare simulation, and indeed, and look at all of these different types of jobs that popped up when I, when I did that. I, I put it all into buff buckets. I'm not going to read them specifically, um, but there's opportunities for everybody. And there's a ton of jobs. If you're sim ops, I, I don't, don't listen my staff, but there are a lot of great opportunities out there. Um, where are the buckets in? They're in corporate world, so industry, uh, you know, simulation equipment, device, education, universities and colleges, hospitals, healthcare, system, healthcare systems, and then the federal government. Um, and there are so many opportunities at SSH between section SIGs, affinity groups, um, to get involved, get expertise. And so I, I recommend and really encourage you all to get involved if you are excited about any of these future opportunities. Uh, it's going on the website. Um, and then because it's SS, uh, Healthcare Simulation Week, I just wanted to share some of my favorite pictures when I was just quickly going through over my career. This was a uh, um, uh, sim wars that we did during uh, ASAP um, during Halloween. And so all the teams were in costumes and the T-Rex trying to intubate was hilarious with the short arms. Um, this was one of the earlier sim wars at IMSH that we did. We used to hold them every year. Um, you could probably recognize some of the judges on the panel. And, you know, we had a really uh, fun time uh, with a lot of, you know, uh, folks participating from the audience. Um, this is scary looking. It's just moulage. Um, but we've created some really, um, you know, this is called, you know, severe hemoptysis. Um, and they had to intubate using all kinds of things, using a task trainer. Uh, the lightnings uh, simulation was a lot of fun. We do that every year. Um, this was at uh, uh, in Colorado at Denver uh, Children's Hospital, and we um, did sim wars, and everybody was a Barbie character. It was a Disney theme one, so um, a lot of fun. Um, some great moulage. This is a tattoo artist that came and moulage the uh, a Woody that got you know bounced around the back of the pickup truck. Um, uh, this is a disaster that we did in our back parking lot in our loading dock using a smoke machine at Camels. Um, and these are actors and our simulation team sort of getting, you know, we had, to, we had to turn the simulations over around each group. So this is a lot of hard work to do. Uh, this is the military simulation or the, the, um, the, the uh, evacuation simulation that we did from the hurricane. Um, and then COVID, you know, we did a lot of COVID simulation. Our staff was in the hospital, you know, a lot of our staff, it was volunteer. They, you know, but they all volunteered and because, you know, they don't get into the simulation business to be exposed to a virus of unknown um, uh, potency. And this was back March, April, May of last year. And I couldn't be more proud of our team for helping. Uh, we trained over 500 staff at Tampa General or Level One Trauma Center um, and, you know, learning how to do uh, donning and doffing. And, and we were, they were testing all kinds of things at the time um, and running simulations. That is it. This is our team at Camels. Um, we do have just some job op opportunities at SimOps and stuff, so I will put that pitch out there. Um, other than that, you can follow us on social media. Um, we have a pretty big social media presence. presence and if you want to follow me, I'm on uh, both LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, that is it. Thank you. Questions? Um, you all now have the opportunity to unmute yourself, so feel free. And and if you want to come off cameras, I'd love to see you. Yeah. Should I should I Cynthia, take this? There's, yeah, if you stop your share. And then Cynthia, there's a question in the chat box if you want to read it or I can. 
Oh, you're on mute, Cynthia. Thank you. Okay, this is from Kevin Arden of Body Interact. He said, for a recent healthcare graduate, MD, what further training pathway do you think would provide the greatest opportunities in healthcare simulation? Recent healthcare graduate, uh, MD, medical doctor? Yes. Is that what I heard? Um, yes. Uh, so, so if you want, it depends on sort of where you want, where you see yourself. I always ask folks that are early in their career, like, where do you see yourself in five years? If you see yourself working in your respective professions program, uh, whether it's a department or a residency or fellowship, then I think a fellowship in simulation is very helpful. There are different combinations, one year, two years, some have masters. There are a lot of them throughout the, the country. SSH is accrediting them now, so you can now graduate from an accredited fellowship, not through ACGME, but through Simulation Society. So I think there's some great opportunities uh, there. Um, if you are trying to sort of pivot to a different area like industry, et cetera, I think, you know, being immersed in places that are innovating, I think are really important and you can still do a fellowship and innovate as well. There are master's programs in simulation, um, there are graduate programs in simulation. I, I you know, I think those are all uh, great as well. Um, again, it really depends on what your, what your, you know, five-year plan is, 10-year plan is uh, that'll require degree, non-degree experience, non-experience. Kim Layton just shared uh, the podcast Healthcare Super Teams is amazing, and she looks forward to each new episode. Thank you for that plug. Um, so yes, Healthcare Super Teams is a um, podcast. We have a monthly um, uh, guest that I, I, I facilitate or moderate or interview. Um, our first seven episodes were on team training. And so the first speaker was Eduardo Salas, who I think many of you know. Um, and then we, I, I interviewed T, uh, experts from different professions to try to learn about their best practices to bring it back to healthcare. So I interviewed a scientist sending a team to Mars, CEO of Nestle Corporation and other folks. Um, we recently started a new series um, on uh, racism and bias in healthcare. And this week we have Jen Arnold, who was our featured guest, and she talks about um, diversity in uh, uh, people who are disabled um, or people who are, have disability um, and her journey through uh, to becoming a doctor and, and talked a lot about advocacy. So please tune in. It's available on all uh, podcast channel, Healthcare Super Teams and Jen Arnold is this week, so. Mm -hmm. And Colleen Rayner has shared a link to the podcasts. Also, Matthew Charnesky shared that this, uh, he, I believe he's speaking to professional tracks. It's a, a passion project of his, if anyone wants to talk about professional tracks through SIM. Okay. Thanks, Any Matt. Any questions? That's it. Okay. I like talking I to <laughs> simulationists. Ah. Mm -hmm. Hey, I just want to say, Haru, that was fantastic, man. And some other stuff, it's not my expertise and not my field of expertise, some of that, but it was it was really great. And I, I like your insight into IPE. Um, as a nurse, we trained the exact same way you did with no other professions and only knew our own uh, and only built confidence in our own skills and knowledge sets and the way we thought. So um, I love um, how you embrace that. We don't hear all the professions say that, and we don't say it enough as nurses either, that we we trained incorrectly <laughs> for years. Right. Um, so I love it. I love the freedom of being able to say that out loud too. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, this is Julie Maxworthy. Through, great oh, job. Um, love all the pictures. There's so much, there was, it was amazing. Uh, <clears throat> And I also want thank to take you. a moment. I want to take a moment to thank you for um, and your site for you know having us for SimOps this past summer. It was the first time we actually got to get together again, and from everyone I talked to, it was a huge success. So I appreciate greatly that you opened up your site to uh, the society and to our members to participate because it's it was um, a great. I heard only positives from it. So thank you again. Thank you, Julie. It was, it was great seeing. We had, I think, about 130 folks, and then we had like 20 plus uh, industry or vendor folks come out and uh, had a great time. I hope we'll all be able to meet again in person in LA. I'm really looking forward to it. I am vaccinated. I'll get my boosters, whatever it takes. I want to get out there and uh, be uh, engaged with everybody again. Yeah, I, I think that's, I see all the nods. Everybody's in agreement with you. Rachel, did you have a question? 
Okay, sorry, I saw you on mute. <laughs> Do we have any other questions or comments from those on the call today? Haru, any, any update on the new edition of uh, designing at the book? Yeah, so all the chapters, well, Julie could give the update too, but I mean, I think all of the chapters generally have been submitted. So we're just getting proofs and um, kind of, you know, sort of there's last minute things that people are asking, they're, they're asking, the publishers are asking us to rearrange, but we are, our, our edits are done, they're in, and we're just kind of waiting now. How exciting, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate everybody's contribution. I mean, the the the, the chapters were all incredibly written and thoughtful and there there's gonna be so much uh, learning opportunity for everybody. True. If we don't have any other comments, Cynthia, do you wanna close us out? Um, and let me know if you want me to do reminders for the events coming up tomorrow. Um, one last question, if I might. Sure. Sorry, I um, just came up from the side. I was just. I think we can. I, oh, sorry. Eva, we can hear, hear you. You can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I was just in. <clears throat> I was just inspired by your uh, talk about uh, research within simulation. So I was wondering if you had some references, perhaps, uh, where you would uh, suggest to look into refer uh, to uh, resource, um, uh, results on um, what you actually gain by simulation training. Uh, so what are the outcomes, the evidence around yeah, yeah, simulation? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, I, you know, I, I'm sure we have some great researchers on the line that might have suggestions anybody want to take a crack at that i mean i have articles in my head i have articles in my computer um i don't necessarily have one place to go but other folks have any suggestions on where eva can go to get access to all the the, the latest and greatest i will put a link in the chat to the research committee homepage. there's a lot there um also recommend the ssh knowledge map which you can find uh, by clicking on this link I will share. Uh, that is an exciting new tool that has everything you'd like to know about research in it. Um, if you haven't used the knowledge map, I strongly suggest it. So those will get you started. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Well, Eva, where are you, where are you uh, calling from? Thanks, Kathy. <clears throat> I'm calling from Copenhagen, Denmark. So wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> wonderful. I'm working great at early. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay, well, um, thank you all for joining us today. And uh, I just wanted to point out that we had eight different countries, people from eight different countries join us, and at least 18 states. There are probably a few others in there that uh, didn't share their location. So that's a really awesome global presence. So we thank you very much, and we hope you enjoy Healthcare Simulation Week. And just a reminder that tomorrow we have two webinars, one at 10 a.m. Eastern, Does Simulation Matter? And one at 6 p.m. Eastern, Simulation and DEI, Can We Talk? I put the link in the chat box for where to register, and it's where you registered for this one. So we're excited that you were all able to join today and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Take care.